morning. I'm just going to read a quick statement before we kick off into, uh, into uh, statements. So, so I draw your attention to the special arrangements in the Federation Chamber. The most obvious change will be the seating arrangements and the increased space between seats. Uh, seats have been arranged to better satisfy spatial distancing requirements. Please ensure you uh, do not move the seats and kindly observe the capacity limit of the Federation Chamber. Water is available at the usual water tables. Members are asked to collect their own water and are requested to dispose of the empty bottles themselves in the bins. Alternatively, members can bring their own water into the chamber. Hand sanitizer is available at several locations within the chamber. Uh, the uh, entry doors to the Federation Chamber will remain open during proceedings. This will reduce the need for members to touch the door handles. However, members should not stand outside the entr entrances in order to view the proceedings. Finally, you will also note the presence of photographers from the press gallery. Given the historic nature of the current sittings, they've been granted permission to take photos of proceedings in the Federation Chamber for the next two days. So I thank all members. Are there any constituency, any constituency statements um, from honourable members? And I call the member for Bendigo and welcome her back. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, it has been a challenging time, particularly for workers and businesses. And since the government's rollout of the JobKeeper program and other measures, uh, I have decided and started a survey of just how the government support is actually helping businesses. And what we found, Deputy Speaker, is that 67 per cent, only 67 per cent of the businesses that we survey had accessed any government support, mostly JobKeeper and the cash flow boost. When it came to JobKeeper, these were some of their comments. Poorly communicated, poorly rolled out. Given the short time frame, there was always likely to be problems. However, the government has moved quickly from the position of we're all in this together to making businesses bear the brunt of the work and the costs. Confirmation, paying wages in advance is a challenge. It's really scary if we make a mistake or the payment doesn't come through. So many workers eligible for JobKeeper um, but I don't have the cash flow to pay them in advance. I haven't participated because of this fact. Deputy Speaker, the government needs to do more to help our businesses, particularly our small businesses. If you want to snap back, you need to ensure that more have access to JobKeeper and more have the ability to access loans to help those in need. Deputy Speaker, there's another area of JobKeeper where the government has really let the community down, and that's with universities. I was saddened and very disappointed to read last night that La Trobe University has moved to offer redundancies to their workforce, not all their workers, but they're calling for voluntary redundancies, and they said it's because the government did not extend JobKeeper to universities. In fact, they changed the rules again and again to actively exclude them. It is this government's fault that workers at La Trobe University in my electorate will now find find themselves unemployed, out of a job. I hope the university does not have to go to forced redundancies. Universities, as all members know, in regional areas are important employers. We want to be a university city in Bendigo. We want to make sure we have that link between universities, research and our manufacturing sector. However, it will only happen if the government helps Bendigo, La Trobe and all universities right now. It is not their fault that they are in this situation. Because of this health crisis, because governments have moved quickly to close down our economy and our society, they are in this position. Just like the government is helping businesses and not-for-profit organisations, they should help universities like La Trobe. They should help save these hundreds of jobs that we need. To snap back, you need universities. The government should act today and extend job care. Member's time has expired. I call the member for Ford. Well, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, this year we've seen our lives change, uh, and change forever, and more, no more so than in our local schools. 
and across Australia and in my electorate of Ford, teachers and schools have been working hard each and every day to support the students and families in light of the pandemic we're going through. And I know the past couple of weeks have been difficult for all, especially for the parents who are working from home and also trying to help their kids learn. I want to take this opportunity, Mr Deputy Speaker, to thank those parents who have gone to great lengths to support their children during what has been a challenging and uncertain time. Equally, Mr Deputy Speaker, the wonderful teachers and schools across my electorate of Ford, which covers parts of Logan City and the Gold Coast, have also done a fantastic job for the students that have needed to attend school, especially those uh, in vulnerable situations, uh, sadly, which is uh, common in parts of my electorate, and also the children of our essential frontline workers who are doing such a great job at this time. And over the past couple of weeks, we've seen our schools innovate and adapt to these changing circumstances. And I want to take this opportunity to give a shout out to just some of the great schools and teachers who have done some truly amazing things to support our kids. At Beanley State School, they set up a drive-through zone to allow parents to collect home learning packs and were recently featured on uh, Channel 7 News in Brisbane for that initiative. Eden's Landing State School had an Anzac Day drive-through service with students and their families paying tribute in their driveways and Principal Mr Curran and the school's adopter cop Aaron from the local police beat also joining them in their cars. Cedar Creek State School Principal Mr Myers has started a new band with the teachers, aptly named the Creekers, which boosts the spirit of the students and families. At Coomera Springs State School, they had a drive-through Mother's Day stall. Eagleby State School has been looking through uh, doing a book and maths game exchange, and at Eagleby South, Mr Barnes, Ms, Mrs Morgan and Mrs Dillon have joined together in songs to cheer up the kids learning from home. Kimberley Park and Brony Heights State Schools I welcome their preppies back this week with great fanfare with the school fences decked out with balloons and decorations. And lastly, but certainly not least, Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr Evans, the principal for uh, one of the teachers at Norfolk Village State School, has started in a fun video showcasing what it's like to teach from home, starring his dog Chai. So Deputy Speaker, our teachers and our school staff more generally do an incredible job each and every day and I'm sure they're all eager to see the students return to school. But most importantly, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's done in a safe way for all involved. I call the member for Brand. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I would like to put on the record of the Parliament of Australia my sincere thanks to the community of Western Australia, and in particular, my constituents in the electorate of Brand. They have observed the social distancing rules and restrictions that have been placed on our everyday lives. Following these rules have saved, has saved lives and kept our community healthy. The city of Rockingham has the most beautiful beaches in the world, yet on the hottest days in recent months, we didn't overcrowd those beaches. People did the right thing by each other. They went to the beach, went for a walk, went for a swim, and then they went home. Uh, because of this, uh, there was no inkling of the overcrowding we have seen elsewhere, and our beaches from Singleton and Golden Bay in the south up to Quinana Beach in the north uh, are still open, and we continue to enjoy them for what is left of the most beautiful Western Australian summer and autumn. The community has supported vulnerable people uh, that need our help during these uh, community uh, restriction times. And I thank the people of Brand for the wonderful community spirit that has seen us through this crisis and will continue to see us through this crisis. Many have lost their jobs, businesses have closed, and some, sadly, will never reopen. Some jobs will never come back. Many people will struggle for a long time to come as our devastated economy is rebuilt. So that community spirit we've seen across Rockingham and Quinana will be called upon again and again for a long time in the future to help those who need our support. I'd also like to thank uh, the staff uh, of uh, the local government authority, City of Quinana and City of Rockingham. Both uh, city councils and all the workers have been remarkable in this time of hardship. Many have lost their jobs, uh, unfortunately, because local governments weren't supported through JobKeeper. But nonetheless, I know the city councils are doing their best to keep these uh, people together. Um, in particular, Mayor Carol Adams uh, and new CEO Wayne Jack from Quinana, who he, Wayne himself was in the process of moving 
moving with his family from New Zealand when this happened, but he has soldiered on and did get here, even with all the restrictions and quarantines which were, of course, observed. Thanks also to Rockingham Mayor Barry Samuels, CEO uh, Michael Parker, Emily Chandler, Karen Lee and Tony Solon at the Rockingham Quinana Chamber of Commerce. Now, I'd also like to sincerely thank the staff of all the electorate officers, state and federal, around the country. The staff of ministers and shadow ministers who have helped my office to resolve some very desperate situations that emerged, uh, have emerged, continue to keep emerging through the COVID-19 restrictions. In particular, I'd like to thank my staff, Jacinta Pemba, who has coordinated with great patience and effort and diligence all our constituent inquiries. Kate Gerbiel, Rex Tion, Ryan Pavlinovich, Georgia Tree and Andrew Burrell. My Order. staff... Order. A division has been called for the House. The proceedings are suspended to enable honourable members to attend the division. The proceedings will resume when the chair of the Federation Chamber is resumed at the conclusion of the division uh, or subsequent divisions. I call the member for Brand. And Andrew Burrell. My staff, like so many around the country, have shown a deep commitment to our constituents and to the people of Brand, and I'd like to thank them most sincerely on behalf of the whole community. Thank you. And I call the member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The current coronavirus crisis has shown Australians at their very best. Yet, disgustingly, there are some out there, both from here and abroad, who are seeking to make financial gain off those who are anxious and vulnerable. This is a time when many are fearful for their health and safety and that of their families. But we cannot afford to let our guard down when it comes to scammers pretending to offer much needed help or advice. The ACCC's scamwatch.gov.au website has received over 2,000 coronavirus related scam reports with over $700,000 in reported losses since the COVID-19 outbreak commenced. To avoid being scammed, it's important that we remember to follow some simple advice. Don't click on unexpected documents or hyperlinks in text and social media messages or emails, even if it appears to come from a trusted source. And never respond to unsolicited messages, emails and phone calls that ask for personal or financial details, even if they claim to be from a reputable organisation or government authority. If you do think you have identified a scam, it's important to visit scamwatch.gov.au to report it so that others aren't caught out. The scammers can be exceptionally convincing, and importantly, we should all be alerting others, especially our senior Australians, to any scams we come across. Other ways in which people seek to play on our fears during the crisis is through spreading misinformation about the health aspects of the virus. We are seeing the quacks and the charlatans trying to have their moment in the sun. The case of Pete Evans and the infamous biocharger has perhaps been the most prominent example we have seen here in Australia. One such false claim which has provoked scores of emails to my office is that the flu vaccination can cause recipients to become more susceptible to coronavirus. To be very clear, the flu vaccine does not contain live viruses and does not weaken our immune system. The reality is that there has never been a more important time to get your flu shots. Getting the flu and coronavirus at the same time could be a very deadly combination indeed. We know the flu is responsible for thousands of deaths each year, and any person trying to convince others to avoid being vaccinated is being recklessly and cruelly irresponsible. The final piece of this cavalcade of coronavirus nonsense is the claim by conspiracy theorists that 5G radio waves are somehow linked to the virus. This is an absolutely baseless claim, which has been refuted time and again by radiation and medical experts. The coronavirus crisis is a time in which we must all be listening to proper health advice guided by expert health officials. Australia is home to some of the best in the world and we can be proud of their contribution to the global efforts to fight this virus. So to all Australians, I urge you to be cautious and alert to anything that seems too good to be true or just an outright lie. We will get through this together based on good science and good advice, which thankfully we have in abundance in our country. I call the member for Indi. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I seek leave to present certified petition number EN1412 and to speak to that petition. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. If there's no objection. I also seek leave to table an uncertified petition on the Beechworth principles as a document for referral to the petitions committee. Is leave granted? 
Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. A short time ago, in late February, I spoke in this place about the genesis of this petition and how the Beechworth principles came to be. I shared the story of William Guest, an innocent young gold digger from Beechworth who in 1853 was gunned down in a flagrant misuse of police power that went unchecked. I also shared the story of an impassioned and resolute community of gold diggers in Beechworth who witnessed this injustice and refused to stand by and let their government respond to perverse breaches of public trust by conducting sham, closed-door inquiries into itself. Mr Speaker, this story may have been 167 years ago, but its principles rang true and deep for Australians today. Australians who believe our democracy is straining, Australians who are exhausted from politics prone to corruption, partiality and scandal. Just like 1853, the community has raised its voice again. The Beechworth principles are simple but compelling, calling for a Federal Integrity Commission with five key characteristics. Broad jurisdiction to investigate the people it needs to, common rules so that everybody is held to the same standard of behaviour, appropriate powers so that it can actually do its job, fair hearings so that investigations are done openly when in the public interest, accountability to the people so that the Commission answers to public, not political interests. These five principles stand, Mr Deputy Speaker, not as an ultimatum but as an invitation. These five principles are directed at a government that has missed its own deadlines to introduce this bill. Instead of an integrity commission, Mr Speaker, this, has instead, this government has instead given us bountiful examples of why we need an integrity commission. In 1853, Dr Owens, who led the fearless campaign for an independent inquiry into the circumstances of the shooting of William Guest, asked the people, do you know what representation means? Of course you do. It's never an accident that one finds themselves on the just side of history. Rather, it is a conscious choice to do so. Mr Speaker, here are a set of endorsed and enduring principles upon which this government can do right. I call a member for Mallee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The COVID-19 pandemic has had some unexpected outcomes in my electorate. Many people in Mali have made the most of social distancing restrictions by refurbishing gardens, sheds and homes and business sites. When we emerge from this lockdown, I think our community assets will be in far better shape than when we entered it. But I want to talk this morning about another refurbishment program which is exciting for the agricultural show societies in Mali. Normally, there are around 580 agricultural shows across Australia each year. These shows contribute around $965 million to the economy, and nearly 6 million Australians attend. Agricultural shows are a yearly highlight in Mali, and like so many important events in 2020, they have been postponed due to the coronavirus pandemic. I'm thrilled today to speak about funding which Minister Littleproud and I have announced this week for three agricultural shows in my electorate through the Commonwealth Grants Regional Agricultural Show Development Grants Program. Just over $1 million has been allocated to the Mallee towns of Kahuna, Horsham and Natamuk to help show societies refurbish their show grounds and facilities. The annual agricultural show is always a big event. And thanks to this grant, next year's will be even better. All three show society recipients were very excited to receive the good news this week. Graham Pearce told me that the Kahuna and District Agricultural, Pastoral and Horticultural Society will be using their $475,000 to replace the Morton Garner Pavilion at the Kahuna Recreation Reserve. Andrea Cross from the Horsham Agricultural Society told me her team will be utilising their $125,000 to undertake works to refurbish Maydale Pavilion and build a disabled toilet at the Horsham showgrounds. When I spoke to Judith Bysouth from the Natamuk Agricultural and Pastoral Society, she said their $499,000 will be used to upgrade the multi-purpose pavilion at Natamuk showground including the development of a grain arcade exhibit which showcases regional farming. Agricultural shows are the heart and soul of our regional communities. They bring and keep communities together, bridge the divide between country and city and provide a key injection into the local economy. 
Upgrading show facilities means more visitors to these regional events, more local employment and more purchases for local businesses. The grants benefit will benefit both agricultural show societies and their regional communities. Once again, I congratulate Kahuna, Horsham and Natamuk show societies for their award-winning submissions and I look forward to attending these shows next year and see their completed works. Thank you. I call the Honourable Member for Hayes. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, yesterday we, we, we commemorated International Nurses Day and it's appropriate we take time to uh, show our appreciation, our gratitude for the extraordinary contribution nursing um, makes in our community for the well-being of people, families and indeed the community as a whole. Yeah. Now more than ever, we should show our appreciation and gratitude for the tireless effort of our nurses and indeed all our health workers during these unprecedented times. The reality is that every time they start their shift, they are putting themselves at significant personal risk and it doesn't end when they leave work. Uh, given fears of possible uh, exposures uh, to their families. I think uh, we, we should show our appreciation for all of those involved in our health community as a consequence. Particularly this year when we acknowledge that uh, there are many nurses and health workers around the world who have lost their lives treating and caring for patients uh, affected by the coronavirus. Nurses are an integral part of our health service and we must acknowledge the multifaceted role they provide as caregivers, uh, patient advocates and educators. Uh, what is readily apparent, uh, Debbie Speaker, is that our health system only works effectively through the cooperation of all those involved. I therefore take the opportunity to reflect broadly on the invaluable contribution provided by our health workers, including of course our nurses, uh, but our dedicated doctors, cleaners, lab techs, hospital uh, caterers, uh, uh, support staff, paramedics, and the list goes on. Our health workers are doing a tremendous job and our lives and the lives of those we love are depending on them. Uh, they are working at, at the front line to, to help our community stop the spread of coronavirus under enormous pressure in the most trying of circumstances. And incredibly, we've heard stories uh, of health workers being spat upon or abused in the streets simply because they are working on the front line of this pandemic. Clearly, these are extremely uh, uh, difficult and trying times, um, uh, which uh, no doubt uh, is taking a significant personal uh, and emotional toll on, on many of our health workers and others on the front line. On behalf of a very grateful community, I thank our nurses, uh, all our health workers for their dedicated uh, dedication and commitment, and particularly during uh, uh, the times of this pandemic. They are making an extraordinary contribution uh, for uh, the, uh, and making a difference for the better in our community. So on this 200th anniversary of uh, the birth of Florence Nightingale, best regard to all our nurses and all those who are helping us uh, throughout our health system. Are there any constituency statements? I call the Honourable Member for better long. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit all our communities in different ways and today I would like to take some time to discuss the experience in my community in Bennelong. I think it is very important in a time like this that local stories are not subsumed by the big stories sweeping the world. I have been heartbroken by the damage the pandemic has done to my community, but I am heartened and proud of the way the community has responded to these unprecedented challenges. As many will remember, one of the first and cruelest outbreaks of the virus occurred in Macquarie Park at the Dorothy Henderson Lodge. In early March, the first positive test result was returned for a worker at the lodge. It was the first case of untraced community transmission in Australia. This was a terrifying prospect. In the following weeks, tragically, more residents succumbed to the virus. In total, six residents of the community lost their lives. This is a terrible and appalling loss of life, and to the families of those residents who have passed away, I offer my sincere condolences. Fortunately, we are blessed with wonderful healthcare workers who rose to the challenge. The staff at the lodge did their utmost to curb the transmission of the virus and manage existing cases. Their vigilance and effort is reflected in the fact cases soon began to decline. I am proud to inform the House that as of 1 May, 
Dorothy Hendon, Henderson Lodge has been free of coronavirus. Despite this, it must be remembered that our broader community has felt some of the worst effects of the pandemic. In total, Ride has experienced some 66 cases, one of the biggest counts in the country. Although we have now seen the number of active cases slowly decline, we cannot grow complacent now. There is always the looming prospect as of a second wave, which may do far more damage than the first. After all, the vast majority of the deaths that occurred during the Spanish flu last century occurred after the first wave had passed. Despite these gloomy prospects, I take hope in the small acts of kindness, bravery and generosity which have populated the last few months, seeing the work of some of our community organisations to do help for our most marginalised during this particularly challenging period has reminded me of the strong bonds which link us together. I would like to acknowledge the admirable efforts of everybody, from our nurses to our charities to everyday people for pulling together to help us get through this. A great man once asked not to be judged in victory, but during the uncertainty of battle. Our judgment during this uncertain battle that together we Australians have fought bloody well. Are there any constituency statements? I call the member for Wills. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I think I can speak for my uh, electorate of Wills and the people of Wills, and probably for most Australians, to say that uh, things have been very tough for all of us. Um, our daily lives have been turned upside down, and many of us have felt fear, um, have been scared about our health or how to make ends meet. Uh, the road we're on uh, is going to be a long one and an uncertain one. Uh, but I think today we can also say that Australians have shown remarkable resilience, perseverance and spirit. Uh, and in a sense, the crisis has shown uh, our nation's strengths uh, to each other and to the world. We've proved with that collective effort and great sacrifice that we can flatten the curve and save lives. But of course, there's still a lot more we need to do to come out stronger on the other side. Now, while the coalition government with Labor's support, has delivered historic uh, economic stimulus packages to assist people. Um, those very same packages uh, have some flaws. Despite our urgings and our arguments, they have left many Australians out of the payments. And indeed, there's been a lack of urgency as well, coupled with that, the government not acting fast enough to save jobs. Now, we Labor called for a wage subsidy weeks before the government finally announced JobKeeper. While welcome, of course, it was still too late for too many people and for too many small businesses, Deputy Speaker, uh, that have hit the wall. And I've spoken to many of these small businesses and these small business owners in my community. Some are still uh, waiting for their payments. Some are also uh, hitting the wall and having to let people go because they couldn't wait that long period of time, those, that month or six weeks, for the JobKeeper payments to come through, particularly given the uncertainty about whether they get it or not. And I've heard so many other people talk to me about uh, falling between the cracks with respect to the packages. And I think the government has made some very unambiguous decisions, and potentially we could say ideological decisions on who they have decided to leave out. A million casual workers. Countless local businesses have struggled because they haven't had the cash flow to, to be able to wait for JobKeeper to kick in. Workers from the arts and the entertainment sector, those with a disability and carers, charities in, in the local government sector, and people on temporary visas. And the crisis has shown that the coalition cannot be trusted to do it right, to not leave millions of the most vulnerable behind or to implement the policy fairly, certainly not without the necessary scrutiny. There is an opportunity to strengthen Australia as a compassionate country, a nation that looks after everyone, no matter their status or their job description. And I've already seen in my own community of wills what people have done for their neighbours, for the strangers, for the most vulnerable. And during our separation, we have really stuck together on that basis. And my office has seen a surge of calls and emails, letters from people needing help. And we have done our best, uh, with a lot of volunteers, I might add, to help those people through this most difficult period. Uh, it's been something that's been an important part of be being a good local MP. Are there any constituent statements? I call the Honourable Member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to commend all Australians on their outstanding work in following the evidence-based recommendations that the Prime Minister of Australia and the National <coughs> Government have executed on behalf of us all. We've all seen the devastation of the outbreak that COVID has caused across the world, in particular in the US, in Europe and in England. 
But with less than 100 deaths currently in Australia, we are faring better than most. And this can be attributed to the strong border protection measures implemented very early on in this outbreak, strict quarantining measures that Australians have engaged with and followed, <laughs> and the strong physical distancing measures that have been carried out across Australia. Now, we know that this has had an effect on all Australians, and we've done it because it's been important. Staying home has helped contain the COVID pandemic so that our fatality rate is now lower than an annual flu season. That's something we should celebrate and feel that we've done the right thing. We are fighting this virus and we are winning, but it is now time to get ahead of a mental health curve that may occur. It is now important to balance the state of the economy with the health of the nation. We cannot forsake the prosperity of Australia, but more important, the mental health of Australians represent a very important aspect of our nation. And I'd like to congratulate the Minister for Health, Greg Hunt, for him putting this front and centre for all Australians. Failure to re ease restrictions now that we are in a safe harbour and keep the economy strong will see a mental health crisis that could be more damaging than the pandemic. Modelling conducted by Sydney University has predicted a potential increase of suicides of up to 50 per cent. These are horrifying numbers that should be taken seriously. With a projected increase of, um, of unemployment up to 10 per cent, the significant changes to people's livelihoods and the social distancing required for people with regards to their loved ones means that mental health professionals have a big job ahead of them. Our best defence against these outbreaks in our community is by encouraging everyone to use the COVID Safe app. That is our ticket out of here. We know that there will continue to be cases. Unfortunately, coronavirus will continue to see deaths. But these are proportionate to the measures that we have taken. And we need to make sure that we continue to use an evidence-based approach. We've seen the worst of the COVID um, epidemic. We now have the tools at our hands to test, to trap and to trace COVID. We need to make sure we continue to use an evidence-based approach and to remain calm. We know that when overseas gets a cold or sneezes, we get a cold. We want to make sure when overseas gets COVID, we stay safe. Thank you. I understand it is the wish of the Federation Chamber for constituency statements to continue for another 30 minutes. There being no objection, I call the member for Newcastle. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And firstly, I would like to put on record my sincere thanks and appreciation for all of the amazing workers who have continued to serve our community every single day in the face of sometimes quite extraordinary challenges uh, throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. To the frontline workers who risk their own health and wellbeing every day in order to protect ours. To the educators who help nurture, develop and enrich the lives of our children. But also to the unsung heroes of COVID-19, the people who deliver often now to our doors the very things we've needed and relied on uh, during this period of isolation and lockdown. To those who've been serving us in the supermarket or the pop-up stores, markets and takeaways, or those local government workers who are diligently maintaining our public spaces and essential services. Many of them have had to adjust to a difficult new environment, modified jobs, reduced hours, and of course, fear that their duties may expose them and their families to the virus. We are living throughout historic and frankly, catastrophic times. We saw within one week in my home city of Newcastle the collapse of jobs and wages that uh, dwarf the growth of the last four years. There has been uh, Centrelink lines that have spilled out of the office down the street around the quarter for days on end. Throughout this crisis, the opposition has worked constructively with the government to get the best outcomes for the nation. The decisions that have been made certainly are not the decisions that a Labor government uh, would have always adopted, but we did never allow the perfect enemy, perfect to be the enemy of good. And we have always been as supportive as possible. But there is no hiding the fact that the Morrison government's implementation of some elements of the COVID-19 response have been sadly lacking. 
A case in point is the JobKeeper payment. In recent weeks, I have been absolutely inundated with calls for information, advice and help around the COVID-19 responses in general, but JobKeeper has consistently been the number one issue of concern in my community. Labor, let me be clear, supports the principle of JobKeeper. It was indeed Labor that argued for the dire need of a wage subsidy scheme before this government finally relented. But we understand that unless we protect people's livelihoods, a contagion of cascading disasters could quickly develop. Too many people miss out on this scheme. We know of the one million casualised workers, the people in the arts and entertainment industries, the people in the retail, accommodation and food sectors, all missing out. This government needs to fix it and it needs to get us back on track. Are there any constituency statements? I call the member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The past few months have placed unprecedented challenges on our country, and as we begin to take the first tentative steps back towards normal life, we should be thankful for the strength shown by our civic institutions and the sense of duty and dedication displayed by Australians from all walks of life. I would like in particular to single out several organisations and individuals in my own electorate of Wentworth for special thanks and appreciation. Organisations such as Our Big Kitchen and the Coalition of the Ageing which have worked tire tirelessly to ensure that the elderly and vulnerable have had access to quality meals without having to leave the house. Similarly, Holdsworth Community Centre and Wayside Chapel have been there for Australians most in need. These organisations have had their own challenges to deal with, including the requirements of social distancing and other health precautions, and at times a shortage of volunteers. But they have got through admirably, admirably with the generosity and selflessness of dozens of volunteers helping to make their operations work. I'd like to acknowledge the positive role played by Waverley Council, and in particular the Mayor, Paula Marcellus, the General Manager, Ross McLeod, all councillors and the entire council staff. They have successfully helped steer the community through difficult times and in particular have found ways to creatively allow the local community to access the ocean whilst protecting public health through their surf and go and swim and go programs. I'd like also to acknowledge the leadership shown by Willara Council and in particular the Mayor, Susan Wynne, the General Manager, Gary James, all councillors and council staff. The council has again found creative ways to ensure people can enjoy the outdoors and harbour, but without compromising public health interests through their swim and go program. They've also introduced a range of measures valued at $5 million to help ease the impact of COVID-19 on local small businesses. Our public transport workers, including the bus, ferry and train drivers in my own electorate have kept our city moving in the strangest circumstances. Our police force have been adapting rapidly to frequently changing restrictions and bearing the brunt of any public backlash. They have behaved with admirable professionalism and courtesy. Our supermarket staff have turned into everyday heroes, helping working around the clock to keep shelves stocked while adapting to the coronavirus threat. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the difficulties being suffered by many small businesses in my electorate and applaud them for the ingenuity and resilience they have shown in adapting to this new world. Coffee shops, restaurants, gyms, beauty salons and many other businesses have suffered significantly through this crisis. But many have found ways to adapt their business model, to keep their staff on and to keep serving their customers and clients. The coronavirus challenge is not over, Deputy Speaker, but my faith in our ability to come out of this stronger is drawn from the strength of everyday Australians and their ability to rise to the occasion. Thank you to the people of Wentworth for your patience your cooperation and your diligence in getting us through this crisis. Are there any constituency statements? I call the Honourable Member for Perth. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Our country has a newfound appreciation for essential workers, but I think we've also got a newfound appreciation for the fact that every Australian is essential. Uh, in that regard, I welcome the commitment by the government today to further expand our focus on mental health, because I think there are far too many Australians who are finding this current period of time just that little bit too much to handle. And as I said, every Australian is an essential part of our community. My community of Perth has a newfound appreciation for the people who make our society tick. I share with the member for Wentworth who said that our supermarket workers are everyday heroes. They have done so much. I give a shout out to every Coles and Woolies employee in my electorate, those who are at the IGAs in Highgate, Northbridge, Maylands, uh, Mount Lawley and further afield. Uh, these staff have put themselves in harm's way and they have also worked 
around the clock, many working more and more hours than they ever have. Uh, some told me they've worked harder than they have than they would at Christmas. It has been an incredibly challenging time for them and they've stepped up to the challenge and they deserve not just our appreciation, they also deserve appropriate pay and protection of their rights and conditions at work. So to all retail workers, I say thank you. We also have an appreciation of the uh, essential service of Australia Post. Australia Post makes sure that we stay connected in more ways, uh, particularly when we can't necessarily be with those people that we love. Uh, indeed, my state of Western Australia has uh, adopted what some people love, which is a hard border, but the reality is it does mean that many families, including mine, are split across different um, parts of the country at certain times. Uh, having said that, I noticed that Australia Post did make a very difficult decision, and one I was incredibly critical of, to close the North Perth Post Office in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, it is ridiculous that you would close an essential service. Now, I'm not saying the management of the North Perth Post Office is perfect, far from it, but to close a post office in the middle of a pandemic, lock people's mail and parcels away, uh, was just a terrible decision. And I want to put on record also, I'm grateful that Australia Post have since, uh, due to a lot of community pressure, reversed that decision, set up a temporary post office uh, with full postage and mail collection facilities, because it really did leave thousands of people and thousands of businesses in my electorate in a really dire circumstance in April. Uh, so I'm grateful that has been resolved. Uh, but now we talk about what happens next. And the reality is this is going to be a slow rebuild. It is not going to be a snapback. Snap back should go in the same bin as fight back. We can't snap back to having 100,000 Australians have nowhere to call home. We can't snap back to increasing and increasing casualisation and insecure work. We can't snap back to having hundreds of thousands of Australians in poverty because New Start is too low. Are there any constituency statements? I call the Honourable Member for Menzies. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I rise this morning to urge the reform of the World Health Organisation. The German magazine Der Spiegel has reported that the Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, personally asked the WHO to delay the release of critical information regarding the outbreak of COVID-19. The report was based on information from the BND, the German Federal Intelligence Service. It reports that President Xi uh, met with the uh, World Health Organization Director General Tedros on January the 21st to request that he withhold information about human-to-human -human transmission and delay the declaration of a global pandemic. The BND's verdict is harsh. At least four, if not six weeks, have been lost in Beijing's information policy in the fight against the virus, Dea Spiegel reported. So, Deputy Speaker, if this is true, then this is a conspiracy against the whole world. Researchers at the University of Southampton found that if China had acted responsibly and been open about the virus just three weeks earlier, it could have reduced the spread of the disease by as much as 95%. 95%, Mr Deputy Speaker. These reports are consistent with other evidence that the Chinese Communist regime has constantly falsified data and public information about the COVID-19 virus. And it has also led, it has also uh, been, sorry, has also treated the WHO as a vassal for its own purposes. Something consistent, I have to say, with the Chinese Communist Party regime generally. This is why the approach to exclude Taiwan, in particular, from the WHO is reprehensible. With a population of just 23 million people situated 180 kilometres off the coast of mainland China, Taiwan was anticipated to report the highest number or the second highest number of COVID-19 cases globally. In fact, at the end of April, it had only 429 confirmed cases and six deaths. That's a country with a population akin to Australia, and we've done a wonderful job in this country in, in uh, preventing the spread of COVID-19, yet Taiwan, 429 cases and six deaths. And this has been achieved without severe restrictions. As early as the 31st of December, Taiwan started screening passengers on flights from Wuhan. It no doubt noted the reports of a disease and the fact that the communist regime banned internal travel from Wuhan, but not international travel to other countries. 
Accordingly, Mr Deputy Speaker, Australia's call for an in, a independent investigation into the cause of the outbreak is reasonable and justified and should be supported by all members of this yeah, place. Yeah. Are there any constituency statements? I call the Honourable Member for Lilly. Thank you, Acting Deputy Speaker. And I'm so relieved to be back here in the Parliament, the Morrison Government having relented and allowed Parliament to sit before its planned sitting schedule of August to allow us to do our work and convey the messages and the urgency of our constituents here to the Federal Parliament. It is not good enough that the NRL can be back to work in a couple of weeks, but we're not expected to return to Canberra until August. Our constituents deserve better. They expect better of their elected representatives, and Labor will do everything it can this, this week to ensure sittings resume and the good business of Parliament continues as soon as possible. Before I go on, I'd like to give a shout out to all of the essential workers of Lilly who have served us so well during COVID-19. We didn't expect 2020 to look like this, but they have risen to the occasion. We have thousands of health workers who have served us both as patients of COVID-19, of families of patients of COVID-19, and of people trying to get by and conduct their business safely. And we have thousands of retail workers who have risen to unexpected challenges in 2020. They deserve good pay, they deserve our appreciation, they deserve safe conditions at work, and they deserve our support and thanks. Speaking of support for Australians, I want to convey some of the messages that my constituents have been raising with me in the past few weeks about the problems with the JobKeeper and the JobSeeker packages. Now, credit where it's due, these things were good initiatives. It was a good idea to raise the rate of JobSeeker for people above the poverty line. It was a good idea to bring the JobKeeper package in to support people continuing a relationship with their employer throughout COVID-19. But we also have to be humble and acknowledge where these things aren't working as they should, where there are cracks opening and where people are falling through the gaps. That's what we should be doing here in the parliament this week. We should be fixing up those gaps so that everybody is supported in the weeks and months to come. With respect to JobSeeker, people have been talking about issues with Centrelink, issues with communication, issues with people not being aware that their partner's income will affect their ability to access JobSeeker. This is the result of seven years of cuts to the Centrelink system. It's hollowed out and there aren't enough people there and enough resources there to support Australians in this time of need. With respect to JobKeeper and the JobKeeper package, like I said, it's a good thing, but too many people have been left out of the cold by this. 1.1 million casuals still have no support from JobKeeper, and at the moment, no indication from the Treasurer that that is likely to get any better. It's not good enough. Our casuals deserve better. Many of them are casuals not by choice, but by the circumstances in which they find themselves, and they shouldn't be punished for that. With respect to JobKeeper, we are now starting to hear reports of scams where people aren't doing the right thing. Um, obviously, Australians are acting in good faith and most people are doing the right thing, but we need to step up and protect Australians where that's not the case. They have acted in good faith. They expect their elected representatives to act in good faith, to step up and fix those problems while we have the chance here in Parliament this week. Yeah. Are there any constituency statements? I call the Honourable Member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The impact of COVID restrictions on businesses have been profound, but so too has been their resilience and adaptability. Uh, particularly in my electorate of Ryan, small and medium businesses that have been dealt severe blows have adapted, have changed, have rejigged and resourced uh, to redesign their entire business model to ensure they could continue to serve their local community. And I know how much this has been appreciated by the local community because they've reached out and they've spoken to me about how much it means just to get a takeaway coffee and a bit of a chat uh, at, during these anxious times. So I wanted to give a few shout outs to local businesses in my electorate of Rhyme uh, and their staff who have done a tremendous job continuing to serve their communities. Good people like, uh, per, uh, like Paresh at Cafe Tara in The Gap, uh, who normally, uh, Cafe Tara does dine-in meals, He's had to adapt uh, and him and his family are now cooking traditional Indian takeaway that is so successful you have to book weeks in advance in order to make sure that you get uh, your meal. Or Luke and the team at Suburban Social in Chapel Hill, they're a small but popular local bar who uh, following the restrictions of not being able to do dining, completely changed their model to a drive-through service and worked with their, uh, so with their suppliers, who they are supporting as well, to put together produce boxes that people could pick up via drive-through service as well. People like Dean and the team at Jack's Tyres at, Mil at Mitchelton, locally franchised, employing locals, 
They know that cars still need to be serviced and tyres fixed at this time, but to allay the fears of people coming into the workshop, they now offer to pick up your car, return it to your door and sanitise it as well. Gyms were required to shut, uh, unlike other businesses who could still open for takeaway, so they've had to adapt uh, significantly. But local gyms in Ryan know how important physical exercise is to people's mental health, particularly at this time. So people like Lisa and the team at F45 Gym in Pullenvale and Indrapilly have been offering live training through Zoom and pre-recorded daily sessions for their regular clients. Mr Deputy Speaker, the restrictions, as, as worthy and as important and, and, and worthwhile as they have been, have taken a toll on families, individuals and business owners. Today, the Morrison government makes an important announcement to appoint the country's first deputy chief medical officer for mental health. It is vital that mental health, particularly during this anxious time, be elevated as a priority, as this announcement will ensure that it is. We can't allow our fellow Australians to succumb to anxiety and isolation when there is support available to them. I've reached out to every person in my electorate of Ryan this week through their mailboxes to outline the support resources available to them. And I encourage residents in Ryan doing it tough to speak up, reach out and receive the support that is available to them and that we all need from time to time. Are there any constituency statements? I call the honourable member for Holt. Are you looking serious? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I rise today to thank our frontline workers and the local residents in my constituency for their response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic has changed our lives completely. It has been a very challenging time for us all. Federal and state governments have asked Australians to make huge sacrifices, like staying at home to protect our health system and to um, limit infection rates. But due to your actions and discipline and patience, we continue to flatten the curve and keep our community safe. The cost of this COVID-19 pandemic to Australia and Australians has been enormous. Many people have lost their jobs. Local businesses have closed. People have been struggling in isolation, not being able to see family, friends and loved ones, or unable to attend workplaces or move around freely. Sometimes it's been very hard to get accurate information about what to do. I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank, in particular, our frontline workers, our doctors, our nurses, and our testing officials at Casey Hospital, Cranbourne Integrated Care Centre, Westfield Fountain Gate pop-up testing facility for all their work and others in the area for keeping our community safe. In particular, I wanted to thank the Victorian police for enforcing the COVID safe restrictions in Victoria, as I've said, keeping our community safe. I also wanted to convey my condolences to the Victorian police and to one police officer at the academy in particular, who trained, I think, two of those police officers, due to the tragic deaths of leading constable Lynette Taylor, senior constable Kevin King, constable Glenn Humphreys, and constable Joshua, Joshua Presney and this happened during the time of the COVID restrictions, which didn't allow for funerals of the magnitude, I think, that would have occurred to have occurred. I've been to the academy, Deputy Speaker, on a number of occasions. I've spoken to recruits. As I said, there's one particular officer that I'm speaking to today that was involved in training, I think, a couple of those recruits. It caused enormous stress and strain to the Victorian police force and their response. Has, was, was fantastic. It showed their resilience and the courage. But it showed also the dangers that police officers face every day that they're out there trying to protect our community. They can literally, they put their lives on the line every time they put their uniforms on and go to their place of work. So on behalf of us all and to the families of those that have lost those four brave fallen officers, on behalf of this place I wanted to extend my condolences to the family, loved ones and friends. And you are in our thoughts and prayers and to the Victorian police and the people that I work with very closely across the board, thank you for the work that you do in keeping our community safe, not just with the COVID environment, but every day that you're out there on the roads. I thank the member for Holt. And I give the call to the member for Nichols. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Yesterday in the House, I called for, in the House representatives, I called for the Murray-Darling Basin Authority to be broken up in order to create a more transparent and accountable regime when it comes to how we manage our water issues up and down the Murray-Darling Basin. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority has been lumped with 
various responsibilities, but namely, they are responsible for the service delivery, operating our dams and our locks on the Murray River to deliver water to the states. This is mainly funded by the irrigators. Secondly, they have policy work associated with implementing the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. They are the main advocates for the plan and also have the power to step in and prepare plans in the states for the implementation of the Basin Plan. Thirdly, they have the regulatory activities related to the implementation of the Basin Plan, uh, including quantities of water savings generated by the states, water recovery projects, to determine whether or not the state's water diversions are within the limits that are set by the plan. What we, uh, what we find, though, is that there is an enormous amount of, um, of uh, complexity, confusion and issues around the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, shown out by Mr Kelty, who was the Interim Inspector General of the Murray-Darling Basin, and he was giving evidence at the Senate yesterday. And Mr Kelty was more or less talking about the responsibilities of the authority um, and he was mentioning the fact that at the Senate Select Committee on Multi-Jurisdictional Management and Execution of the murray Basin Plan, he said that there was evidence that came from the public suggesting that there might be 700 gigalitres of unallocated water each and every year. Now, in his conversation with the murray Basin Authority, that was watered back, or that was, that was whittled back to 50 gigalitres of water each and every year. So at the time of going to print with Mr Kelty's uh, report, 50 gigalitres of water that is under-allocated or unallocated was the amount printed. But now we understand that over the last couple of weeks, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority has effectively acknowledged that the, the amount of unallocated water is more like 375 gigalitres per year. Um, this is an enormous amount of water. Astonishingly, Mr Kilty is now calling for a single source of truth. That is a blunt statement because it obviously means that we don't have a single source of truth at the moment. Someone who has been working with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority for five months has now uh, has acknowledged that around 370 gigalitres has been under-allocated every year, and yet the Murray-Darling Basin Authority cannot put a finger on where this water is. This is an enormous amount of water. Yesterday we spoke about half a billion dollars of water that evaporates in the lower lakes. Now we're talking about a quarter of a billion dollars worth of water that is under-allocated. Um, I think what we need to do is break up the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and put these various responsibilities into different organisations. Thank you, Member for Nichols, and I give the call to the Member for Layla. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. The communities in law and communities like them across Australia have responded in extraordinary fashion to the pandemic and what we've had to do to prevent our hospitals being swamped, our neighbours being struck down with COVID-19 and the potential loss of life that we are seeing other countries endure. I want to thank every person in Lawler for the way that they have responded, for their adherence to the hygiene messaging, to the stay home restrictions, to the social distancing for those still at work. And I want to thank the local small businesses who bravely took on the challenge to close their doors or adapt and adjust, who've taken on debt to pay JobKeeper and wait now to be paid back, who spoke to me about their concern for their suppliers' businesses and their employees. I also want to thank the essential workers who have kept us going, who haven't had the privilege of working from home like many of us here have. Thanks to everyone who has ridden the bumps and shown the leadership that we needed. But of course, it is not over yet, not the health risks nor the economic pain. So please, keep washing your hands, everyone. I know there are people doing it very tough at the moment in my community and across the country with no sense of what the future will bring. They might be workers, they might be business owners, and I know many would be better supported by this government being more inclusive in the JobKeeper program. The Treasurer can do this. He can include our local Donata workers. He can include casuals who have worked in a business for less than 12 months. He can include business owners who have run a business for less than 12 months. He can include local government workers. He can keep them all connected to their employment, and he should. Deputy Speaker, walking to this place for the first time in a while on Monday, thinking about all of those at home and across the country, I passed the monument of two of our greatest leaders, Curtin and Chifley. And following so many comparisons of the current climate to Australia in the Second World War, I went to read Prime Minister Curtin's speech for re-election in 1943. At the time of the speech, Allied forces had just begun pushing the enemy back from their strongholds on Australia's doorstep. The war was far from over, just like now. 
but signs were emerging, perhaps, but perhaps the tide had turned. In Curtin's speech, Victory in War, Victory for Peace, after he listed the achievements our nation had had in the battles and in the advancement of social security for Australians who had felt the pain, he warned that a lost peace would be marked by horrors of starvation, unemployment, misery and hardship, no less grievous than the devastation of war. And that was what the warning received on Monday from the Deloitte Economics Report was telling us. It was telling us that the Prime Minister's snapback theory was flawed and would have dire consequences. As we continue to win the battle against coronavirus by flattening the curve, we must look towards softening the blow of its economic effects. And most importantly, do not raise the victory banners too soon. We need our economy to be stimulated beyond this virus to support every Australian and every Australian Thank business. Lula, and I give the call to the member for Page. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to recognise Kirby Barker from Evans Head. She is a finalist in the New South Wales Department of Education Early Childhood Educator Award. Kirby is an educator and cultural advisor with Evans Head and Woodburn Preschools. She develops programs about Aboriginal heritage and culture for students. This has included a comprehensive language program and a program that focuses on nature and country. Kirby developed a program that sees 10 children head out to learn in nature every fortnight. She is also part of a working group that promotes reconciliation with the early childhood education sector. Kirby also received the Children's Services Trainee of the Year at the completion of her traineeship. Unfortunately, due to the coronavirus restrictions, the award ceremony is postponed. That didn't stop preschool students from presenting Kirby with the Bestest Childhood Educate Educator Award. Congratulations and thank you to Kirby. Deputy Speaker, I am lucky enough to have some of the most significant landmarks in the country in my region, and one is Nimbin Rocks. The three most prominent rocks were named by the early white settlers as Thimble, Cathedral and The Needle. However, their significance dates back many thousands of years. They are an extremely sacred site to our local Bundjalung peoples. It is believed that the rocks were home to the clever man, a prominent figure in many Aboriginal dreaming stories. When you look closely at one of the rocks, there is a hole in the middle. Elders say this is a window into the home of the clever man who lived in the rock with his family. One night, the clever man left the window open and his daughters fled their home. This is why to this day you can still see a hole through the rock. These stories are still told in many families today. Aboriginal dreaming is an important part of our culture and heritage. These stories are also linked to how Nimbin got its name. There are two meanings associated with the town name. One is connected with the Bundjalung word for camp, hut or house. The other is a Bundjalung word for little clever man who dwells in mountains or rocks. Elders also tell the story of how three geographical, the three geographical landmarks of Wollumbin or Mount Warning, the Pinnacle and Mount Burrell form a sacred triangle which directly connects with Nimbin rocks. Aboriginal peoples don't see sites of significance as separate. They are all connected to each other. Cultural and environment are inextricably linked. So, Deputy Speaker, not only are the Nimbin rocks spectacularly and physically beautiful, they have an important story to tell in Aboriginal dreaming. Thank you. I thank the member for Page. The time for members' constituency statements has expired, and I uh, call the clerk. Committee and delegation business. Order of the day number one, report from the Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs. The question is that the document be noted and I give the call to the member for Jellybrand. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, while I'm not a member of the uh, Social Policy Committee, I have some interest in the subject of this inquiry. Um, I'm pleased to be able to have an opportunity to speak on it here today. Um, I've been following the work of committee members uh, during the conduct of the inquiry into age verification for online wagering and online pornography for some time. I want to take this opportunity to make a few comments on the report produced by the committee and thank committee members for their work on this uh, important issue. Uh, the subject of this inquiry is indeed a serious and difficult one. It's something that I worry about as a father of young kids. What is growing up in a world of ubiquitous online pornography going to do to their development as young men and women, to the way their attitudes towards the opposite sex, particularly men's attitudes towards women, evolve, to their ability to form healthy, respectful sexual relationships. It's a big worry for me, as I'm sure it is for all parents. 
I know that the primary responsibility for dealing with this rests with me as a parent and to have the conversations with my kids about what's out there and what they might be exposed to, about what's realistic and about what's not, about what's respectful and about what's not. I'm sure all parents worry about these things too and want to know that government is doing everything that it can sensibly do to support them in this difficult parenting challenge. This is a serious issue that deserves serious consideration from policymakers. Too often, when confronted with internet harms, people search for a silver bullet, a technology solution that will solve all of our problems. It's rarely that simple. I'm pleased to see that this report doesn't seem to make that mistake. I note in particular paragraph 3.146 to 3.148 of the report in this respect that highlights the weaknesses, complexities and trade-offs inherent in technology-based solutions to internet pornography and concludes by quoting the eSafety Commissioner's recommendation that an effective approach to minimising exposure to online pornography would involve, quote, a combination and layering of technological solutions. The only thing that I would add to this is that these technological solutions must also be layered with social interventions, particularly active parenting and internet safety education. I do also want to support the persuasive additional comments to the committee made by Labor members. Labor members noted in a 9 December 2008 blog available on the web noted that in a 9 December 2019 blog available on the website of the eSafety Commissioner, the eSafety Commissioner stated that, quote, eSafety has supported the implementation of age verification technology as well as the legislative framework that would support it subject to further research and review. This is, the, this is a theme that the eSafety Commissioner picked up in, in her submission to the inquiry, which noted, should the Australian Government wish to progress on developing and implementing age verification solutions or regulations, eSafety would advise that a review should be undertaken first. The eSafety Commissioner has further stated that, quote, age verification is a nascent field, and if it is to be leveraged to protect children and young people from accessing online pornography, then we need to develop a supportive ecosystem, develop robust technological standards, requirements for this type of technology, and better understand the effectiveness and impact of age verification solutions in addressing this policy concern. Further, as highlighted in the inquiry's terms of reference, it is also vital to identify and mitigate the risks associated with the use of age verification before it is rolled out. This is an important point to make. As Labor members highlight in their additional comments, quote, age verification requires further review, research and development in order to be implemented effectively as part of a multifaceted and layered approach to online safety. Labor members rightly noted the international experience and noted that, quote, in year, the, after years of work and millions of pounds expended on its proposal to introduce age verification for online pornography, the UK government announced that it would not be proceeding. This is a recent cautionary tale that demonstrates how complicated it is to get age verification right. Given all this, I want to make Labor's position on this issue clear. Labor strongly supports the work to protect children and young people from the harmful effects of online pornography. We need to make sure that we are using all available measures to keep kids safe online. We also know that in other jurisdictions like the UK, they've tried to implement age verification for online pornography, but have not decided to proceed. Labor will, will, will look closely at what the eSafety Commissioner can come up with in their reviews of this issue to address this difficult but very important issue for all Australian families and parents. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the member for Jellybrand for his contribution and his interest in that uh, very important topic. Uh, thank you. Um, there being no further speakers, the debate is adjourned uh, and the chair will be resumed at 4 p.m. today.
Order. It's my understanding that the Whips have agreed that the motion of the Federation Chamber to now adjourn will be dated today for one hour. Um, the Deputy Prime Minister. Do I move that the Federation Chamber do now adjourn? A second is not required. Uh, member for Kennedy. Um, Speaker, I rise uh, in the adjournment motion to speak of uh, Ian Causley, who was a colleague of uh, <coughs> mine. Um, and got beaten by uh, two votes for the Deputy Premiership of New South Wales. Um, Ian uh, started uh, his adult life cutting cane in the heart of my electorate, in fact, where my uh, office is at Innisfail. Um, and uh, um, so, as a young man, he cut cane by hand. One of the great prides we had in our party in Queensland was that 13 of the Cabinet had cut cane by hand as a young man. Um, we always love using this, of course, against the Labor Party because none of them have ever worked with their hands. No, sorry. Um, um, <clears throat> I uh, visited Ian at his house and uh, he lived on the Clarence River where his family have lived for, uh, I'm told, 150 years and I wouldn't doubt it. And uh, for a man of great wealth and great power, he just lived in a little fibrolite house <laughs> Very humble, um, on the banks of the Clarence River, where you know his great great granddaddy had told uh, lived. Um, um, when I met Ian, I knew him by reputation. Of course, he was a third-ranking minister in the New South Wales government, and uh, I was second-ranking minister in the Queensland government when it fell. And we both came into this place around about the same time. Um, Ian, uh, I'm told, and uh, 600 acres of cane land in Western Australia, in the Ord, uh, and he uh, was one of the biggest cane farmers in New South Wales. And uh, people think of Queensland for cane, but if you drive from the Gold Coast to Moolumba, 200 kilometres, most of that time you will be driving through cane fields. They are actually very big in sugar cane, northern New South Wales. But uh, Ian was chairman of his mill, and you've got to understand, farmers all fight and hate each other. <laughs> To become chairman of the cooperative mill, the farmer's mill, is a very, very big achievement. And to have been there as long as Ian had been before he went into parliament. And uh, when he got out of parliament, he went straight back into it again. And uh, I don't wish to be uh, negative, and I shouldn't be negative. But all the same, um, my last real memory of Ian, and we went out, you know, uh, often to dinner of a night here. Um, now, now, I should just say that when I, before I met Ian, I checked out and uh, I was told that he had 600 acres, which is a very big cane farm, um, in, uh, in um, uh, Western Australia. He was one of the biggest cane growers in New South Wales. He owned two hotels. Um, he was, however you measure people, um, very, very successful, highly respected by his fellow cane farmers. He was my chairman of the uh, I think one of the two sugar mills in New South Wales, or it might have been two of the three. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, Ian saw the world the same way that I did. You know, we come out of the country party, we were much older than the average member here, and uh, we were very much country party. Um, and the country party was founded by John McEwen. He called all the Victorian uh, dairy farmers together, huge meeting. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of people there. And he was only 28 years of age. And he said, from now on, all milk will be sold through the dairy cooperative. Uh, Ian knew the story as well as I did. It was legend inside the country party. And uh, all milk will be sold through cooperative. It'll be sold at this price, and everyone will get a quota. Uh, that's why it's going to be. And uh, three or four of them disagreed with him. So he said, we're going to hold up the meeting. I'll just explain it to you properly out the back. And he built the living daylights out of all three of them, came back in rubbing his fists at anyone else once he'd explained them properly. And from that day forth, he was called Black Jack McEwen. You know, and deserved sobriquet, very deserved sobriquet. And uh, I sat under his picture. But um, um, Black Jack, when he retired from this place, every single rural industry had marketing arrangements which allowed us to have a very acceptable 
and um, I might even say prosperous living, uh, whether it was the, the egg industry or the peanut industry or the maize industry or the fishing industry or the tobacco industry or the sugar industry or the wool industry, even the beef industry, all of our exports, almost all of our exports went at that stage to the United Kingdom and Japan. America was a very important player. But both of Order. those markets were done by an agreed the, upon price. The Honourable Member's t time has expired. <clears throat> Um, an extension has been moved. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Sorry, let me 30 seconds. I'll just wrap up, Mr. So Mr. We'll uh, give speaker. an extension for a period of uh, one minute. Yeah, right. Um, I, I just want to, in conclusion, say that um, Ian left this place soon after the deregulation of the dairy industry. Uh, in that infamous day, every single person in our party room screamed that we had to fight it and we had to die in the ditches over it. And, uh, well, nobody did. But Ian left this place soon afterwards. He retired from Parliament altogether. Uh, he had enormous difficulty living with it. And, of course, uh, I resigned from the party that I'd been the standard bearer in Queensland for, uh, for 20 years. I mean, if you said National Party, so the first word comes in your head, they said Jock Peterson. Second word, that I said my name, and that was in polling, etc. Um, so. The profound effect of moving away into a deregulated free marketplace was, uh, but Ian was a great warrior for us, and it was a great tragedy that he did not leave New South Wales as Deputy Premier, and a great tragedy that he did not lead here as, as our leader. And I think history would have taken a much different turn if Ian had been there. A man who showed great judgment, was a very good Christian, you know, very active in the Anglican Church, uh, Ian. And, uh, and a very tough customer, and Mr. Speaker, a very funny bloke, <laughs> great company, and uh, well, I miss him greatly. He was one of my heroes. Order. <clears throat> I thank the member for Kennedy, and I call the Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, commend the member for Kennedy for his uh, earthy and heartfelt remarks. Uh, Ian Causley was one of the select few who uh, served in not one but two parliaments. Um, Ian was the uh, New South Wales parliamentary member for Clarets from 1984 until 1996, and then won the federal seat of Page and serving there until 2007. While I did not directly <laughs> share time in parliament, unlike the uh, member for Kennedy, uh, with uh, Ian, I, I knew him well, not least through the vast National Party membership network. Uh, I recall his passionate contributions to debate on the floor of state conferences, and I'm sure the member for Lyon can back me up there. Uh, uh, indeed, federal meetings as well. Uh, always a contribution with a genuine belief, a real purpose behind what he said. He said what he meant, and he meant indeed what he said. Ian Causley was also, importantly, a committed local member. The regions mattered to him. He knew his electorate from one end to the other, and when boundaries changed, he was out there quickly to introduce himself to his new constituency areas. He knew the people, but more than knowing the constituency, he understood the constituency, their wants, their needs, their hopes, their aspirations. Uh, the Causey name has long been synonymous with the far north coast of New South Wales. Ian was a renowned farmer, uh, but he extended that experience and passion into the industry through directorships and local organisations. He led the Clarence River Cane Growers Association as president. He extended this contribution into the New South Wales Cane Growers Council, and this proved to be a lifelong commitment to the industry, even after his long and successful service in two parliaments. He, Ian remained committed to his own industry, serving on the New South Wales Sugar Milling Cooperative Board until 2017. It was a natural progression of his commitment to people around him uh, for Ian to stand for and win pre-selection for the state seat of Clarence after four years of opposition on uh, election of the Griner Murray government in 1988 and later in the Faye Armstrong government he served as Minister for Natural Resources from 88 to 90. Uh, for Water Resources, 1991, Agriculture and Fisheries, 93-95, and Minister for Mines, 1993-1995. to And so we see a lifetime of experience in the primary industries translated into service uh, for industries across the state, indeed the nation. In federal parliament, he served as, as a respected deputy speaker for almost six years to 2007, respect that ran across the House of Representatives, across both sides of the parliament. Uh, I, I mentioned that Ian never forgot his personal base, and we can understand something of the effort uh, in representing the best interests of cane growers in New South Wales when 95 per cent of Australia's sugar cane came from north of the Tweed. 
On Ian's passing, Sunshine Sugar, which is a, which is a partnership between the grower-owned New South Wales Sugar Milling Cooperative and the Australian family-owned business Manildra Group, offered a tribute, which gives us a, a very real sense of his contribution and, uh, and an insight into just what he was like. The New South Wales sugar industry has lost a great war horse with the passing of Ian Causley. Having been involved in agri-politics for more than 50 years, Ian was a strong leader and was chairman of the New South Wales Sugar Milling Cooperative during some of its most turbulent times. And indeed, they were turbulent times, but they're lucky they had a good leader in Ian to, uh, to help them see them through those turbulent times. And we mourn at this time uh, his passing uh, with his family members, Craig Causley, Marcel Turner, Derek Causley and Shane Causley. Ian lost his treasured wife, June. He loved her so in 2013 after her courageous battle with cancer. And uh, indeed, the family has requested donations be made to prostate or breast cancer causes in lieu of flowers at this uh, time. Uh, despite June's passing, he did not withdraw. He continued to work in and serve his community, which is a great mark of the man. Reporting on a function in 2006 to mark his 20 plus years of parliamentary service, the Lismore Echo published a wonderful iconic photo of him as a strapping young cane farmer, uh, complete with cane cutter in one hand and a photo essay of his life. Uh, the photo was accompanied by a report on his achievements over that time span, and it was a very, very long report. Uh, those achievements extended far and wide across community life, with Ian recalling how he enjoyed mucking in with local uh, small stallholders at Sydney's Paddy's Markets, backing the little bloke, backing the little guy, against a push for redevelopment of their site into an office and residential block. Paddy's Market stands today proudly, in fact, uh, not in one but in two locations at Sydney's Haymarket and Flemington. At the same time, in 2016, pointed to the depth of commitment we have across National's branches, the wonderful people who comprise those branches to the common good. He was asked who should be his successor. His reply, I don't anoint successors because, as he explained, history tells me it's the kiss of death if you anoint someone and local branch members don't like someone forced upon them. They have to fight their own battles. We think of Ian Causley's family and friends at this difficult time. We share their sorrow at, the, at his passing, but we also share the great pride and satisfaction from reflecting on his life, so well lived, a life lived for others. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister. And I call the member for Fremantle. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Uh, life in, in my community has been rattled by the coronavirus pandemic. I know that's been the case around Australia and also very sharply in other parts of the world. As a local member, I've heard from people experiencing pretty much every aspect of the crisis, people caught overseas, people pushed out of work or having their surgery cancelled or having their business shut down, parents teaching kids at home, many of us unable to see older parents or celebrate milestones, and sadly, some people getting sick and not surviving. Nothing I've seen in my life has swept through as suddenly, changing the way we live, and not just resetting our horizon, but making the horizon hard to see. Through all of that, I've been surrounded by people and organisations in my community that have risen to the challenge. I've seen good humour and resilience and selflessness and great generosity of spirit. It's been amazing, uh, but not surprising. Deputy Speaker, this health crisis moved quickly from being an item on the news to being the most widespread jolt in social, community and economic life in Australia since the end of World War II. In a matter of weeks, we went from bewilderment to real fear when the rate of infection was taking off. Mercifully, we've flattened that trajectory, working together and taking dozens of changes in our stride. Safety tape around all the playgrounds, hand sanitizer on all the benches, toilet roll on none of the shelves, uh, at least for a while, uh, and Fremantle's Monument Hill at dawn on the 25th of April was cold and bare, but candles and poppies were in the driveways throughout the suburbs and the last post played down our streets. Like all of us, I'm grateful that we've managed the health aspect of this crisis so well, so far. That is a credit to our system of government, to the conduct and decision making of the National Cabinet, the Prime Minister and the Premiers, and certainly in Western Australia to the leadership of Premier Mark McGowan and Deputy Premier and Health Minister Roger Cook. It's a credit to our health experts and to our health workforce. And Deputy Speaker, I want to acknowledge all the workers on the front line in aged care and schools and early childhood education, in transport and freight, in chemists and supermarkets. And I want to make special mention of the cleaners in my community and across Australia. Cleaners work in all the places that I've mentioned, in our schools and hospitals, in community facilities and workplaces. They were working before we started today, and they'll be there after many of us have gone home, those of us who are still working. 
Uh, and what they do is sometimes difficult, and I think it's fair to say, or I think people would, would agree, that cleaners are not respected enough and in many cases not paid enough. One thing we know about this crisis, it's an opportunity to reflect on the contribution of a lot of workers that don't get enough recognition. They are the essential workers and we do well to remember that when we get through this. But there's a long way to go. It's remarkable that we're now in a position to begin easing restrictions. We have to do so carefully and with discipline because until there's an effective vaccine, we will remain at risk of a virus that's incredibly contagious and we know is a killer. We've been in the survival phase. The recovery phase lies ahead and it will not be easy. It is risible to suggest that we will snap back. There is a greater risk for many businesses and households that what lies ahead, in fact, is a further snap. Not, the prospect of, not just the prospect of a second wave of infections, but the likelihood of successive waves of economic squeeze for businesses and for workers. The wage subsidy that Labor always said was necessary was implemented by the government in the form of the JobKeeper package, but as winter begins, it's turning out to be a small blanket with many holes. It's all very good to say Australia has to get out from under the doona. There are a lot of people who have never been under that doona so far. No support for hundreds of thousands of casuals, no support for local government, and no support for many in the arts and creative Order. industries. A division has been called in the House, so the proceedings of the Federation Chamber will be suspended to allow members to vote. Uh, proceedings will resume at the conclusion of the division or subsequent divisions and the return of the chair. And as I don't actually have to go to the division, you're free to leave. <laughs>
who've always been looking for solutions to local challenges. Of course, the health challenges are paramount. We saw the very real impact of this early on in the crisis where a relatively small wedding led to a significant cluster of COVID-19 cases uh, in the north of the Illawarra. 42 of the guests of that wedding were diagnosed with COVID-19. So whilst the health challenge has been massive and we have a responsibility to maintain the social distancing arrangements, we also know the economic, uh, the economic challenge is manifest. It is estimated that as many as 12,500 people could lose their jobs throughout the Illawarra and Southern Highlands as a result of this crisis. The areas that are going to be most hard hit will be in hospitality and retail, in entertainment and accommodation, and all of those services which by their nature require close human contact. To prepare us and to assist us through this, we called for an increase to New Start, and that has been agreed by the government, albeit on a temporary basis. We called for a wage subsidy and we welcome the fact that the JobKeeper has been introduced, albeit with some problems. Deputy Speaker, I want to focus on a couple of problems with the JobKeeper program, which I call on the government to address. It has been welcomed by local workers and local businesses, but it strikes us as strange that when so many people are out of work and so many are unable to get access to the JobKeeper program, other workers have experienced an increase in their income. Uh, this, simply put, is not fair, and it could be better designed, and it should be better designed. Deputy Speaker, I'd also like to say something about the need for workers to do the right thing. At a time when so many within our community are volunteering their time uh, to assist community organisations, uh, to do their bit to ensure that the community uh, meets its needs. I think it's also important that if uh, we are uh, providing from the government a job keeper allowance, then workers do the right thing by their employers. So if there is to be some uh, redesign of this program, uh, some obligations to attend work where it is safe to do so and to contribute to the business uh, where the business is doing its best to try and maintain an employment connection with those workers. Deputy Speaker, it's going to take more than good hope and more than slogans to ensure that we find our way out of this crisis economically. Uh, we've proposed some arrangements that need to be put in place. Further fiscal stimulus, further capital works programs, probably more smaller scale capital works programs and diversified public works programs are what is needed. Social housing, small local government infrastructure programs and programs which are going to enable us to pick up those workers who have been displaced uh, from the services sector and find them redeployed in other areas. Um, local land care programs or pest eradication programs lend themselves exactly to this task. All right, and I call the member for Page. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the passing of the Honourable Ian Causley. Ian was the state member for Clarence from 1984 to 1996 and was indeed a distinguished minister in the state parliament. And then he transferred to federal politics and became the member for Page from 1996 until he retired at the 2007 election. And for much of the time that he was in federal parliament, he was indeed the deputy speaker. So it's with great pride that in two of those things, I've actually been able to follow Ian, one as the member for Page, and also as a time I was the deputy speaker. Ian was a very proud member of the Nationals and he was a very important figure within the party and also a very important figure in our community. Ian and his wonderful wife, June, who has passed um, prior to Ian, were a great guide to Karen and I, um, especially when I was first elected. Both Ian and June did the job together, and again, it was a great example for Karen and I to do this job successfully. It is much easier when you do it together with your partner. They were both very passionate advocates for our region. 
And when um, you're an active person like both Ian and June were, Ian obviously was a member and associated with a lot of different groups and um, bodies within our community besides politics. He was the president of the Clarence River Kangrails Association. He was a director of the Aluka Bowling Club, a director of the New South Wales Sugar Milling Cooperative and a member of the New South Wales Cane Growers Council. I always remember something Ian told me very early when I started to become involved more actively in politics. And he said it wasn't always necessarily important that people you didn't necessarily need people to always agree with you because they never would. Um, but he had, as long as they respected you and they knew where you were coming from, he was a he was a larger than life character in many many ways. And look, I'll miss him, and I know many people around the community will miss him. But look, my thoughts are with his children and their families to. Craig and Amanda to Marcel and Scott. Um, I had the uh, Marcel was kind kind enough to come and see me. Ian got um, sort of went downhill, if you like, um, quite quickly in the end. And Marcel and Scott came to see me on a uh, on an afternoon and said, "Look, Ian is, 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 has not got much time left. He's only got a few days left, and indeed he died that night." So I very thank very much to Marcel. I was able to get a message to Ian um, before he passed. Um, to Scott, uh, sorry, to Derek and Shane and Tracy, um, also to his grand grandchildren and great grandchildren, to Bryce, Sam, Amelia, Casey, Chloe, Renee, Dylan, Evie, and Samuel. Um, your father, your father-in-law, your grandfather was a greatly respected person in our community. May he rest in peace. Order, and I call the member for Reid. Um, Thank you. Oh, sorry, oh. sorry. I thought you had concluded your speech. That's, <laughs> that's fine, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge Dr Moore um, from Woolgooga, who has sadly passed away. Dr Moore was obviously a doctor but and a long-standing leader in the, Sikh, in the Sikh community on the northern beaches of Coffs Harbour. He migrated with his family to Woolgooga as a young boy, and despite having no English on arrival, his intellect and personal manner shone through. He was elected the school captain of the Woolgooga Central School and completed his high school studies at Coffs Harbour High School. He then qualified to study medicine at the University of Queensland. He returned to Woolgooga immediately following completion of his medical internship to establish his own general practice. He led Woolgooga's bid to host the 1995 Australian Seat Games, the first time the Games were held outside a metropolitan area, um, which was significant given the size of the town. And Woolgooga has hosted the Australian Seat Games since then in 03, 09 and 15. He recently led the 20-year fundraising effort and construction project to build the iconic temple on the site of Australia's Gurdwara, a building his own father has also been involved in. His, the smile on his face the day that I opened, I will never forget. He will be remembered as a loving husband, father, grandfather, brother and uncle to Sirjeet, Ashley, Amandeep, Sasha, Gurjit, Sabnam, um, Indajit, Amrita, Perminda, Disa, Jagtar and their families. May he rest in peace. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to just acknowledge um, our community. I don't think anyone in this chamber, anyone around the country, um, would have, could have ever predicted um, what our country and indeed the globe has been through in the last few months. It's something that was, could, was impossible to predict. But I'd like to acknowledge our frontline workers, our nurses, our doctors, our medical staff. I mean, we've done a great effort as a country to flatten the curve. And, the coronavirus or COVID-19 has had so far so good in the sense of its impact on us. But I'm also very conscious of the economic impact that this has had on our small businesses and on people's jobs and livelihood, um, and made the public be rest assured we will do everything to get this economy back and going. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Order. Um, and I apologise to the member for the page. Yes. His uh, speech breaks meant that we deprived <laughs> him of 20 seconds, I think, so I apologise. Um, now I call the member for Reid. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise uh, this afternoon to speak about the small businesses of Reed. The coronavirus pandemic has triggered a dual crisis, both a health crisis and a financial crisis, which has presented us with significant challenges um, to our economy in a period where our nation has already been vulnerable due to the drought and, of course, the bushfires. The effects have been felt by Australia's small and medium-sized businesses and the hardworking people that they employ. Australia entered the crisis in a relatively strong fiscal position. Our government took decisive action to protect people's livelihoods wherever possible. It is inevitable that there has been a significant increase in government debt as a result of this crisis. 
However, our government's $320 billion in economic support measures have been designed to protect the structural integrity of the budget and to encourage consumer and business confidence post-pandemic. My electorate of Reid has over 26,000 small to medium-sized businesses. Each suburb has its own unique hub and a small business community. Many are family-owned and many are an extension of our diverse multicultural community. I have heard firsthand from many business owners and having been a small business owner myself, I understand how crippling this financial crisis has been. Across Reid and our country, the Morrison government's $130 billion JobKeeper payment has allowed people to stay in jobs and businesses to keep running. In the absence of JobKeeper payments, it is estimated that unemployment would have peaked at around 15 per cent. Many businesses have pursued incredible innovation and adaptation strategies in response to the pandemic. Reid's cafes and restaurants transitioned to pick up and take away services. Some went a further step, such as Payne Vino Trattori in Croydon, um, who sold their homemade pasta sauces so they could keep, um, get people creative in their kitchens at home. Many gyms and fitness trainers started streaming their classes online for free, such as F45 at Burwood, which helped people stay active and connected from home. Some of our sports clubs have adapted to the restrictions as well. For instance, Strathfield Golf Club and Five Dot Club Tennis Centre were able to arrange golf and tennis within the social distancing restrictions with only two people participating at a time. Unlike other businesses in Reid who have had to close their doors due to the coronavirus, our pharmacies have had to contend with a surge in demand, with patients attempting to stockpile medications and a spike in pandemic-related health concerns. Still, I have seen our pharmacies place the needs of the community first and work incredibly hard during this pandemic. One pharmacy in my electorate of Reid, Wentworth Point's Priceline Pharmacy, provided free hand sanitizer to residents of Wentworth Point, Rhodes and Olympic Park for residents over the age of 65. And in the height of the pan panic buying we saw early on in the pandemic, Abbotsford Family Pharmacy were phoning their most vulnerable patients to make sure they could get their medication coordinated with competing pharmacies and they were sharing stock to make sure that the residents of Reid were looked after. These are just two examples among hundreds in our electorate. Last week, the Prime Minister announced our three-step plan for COVID safe economy, the gradual reopening of the economy in Reid and around Australia. From Friday in New South Wales, we begin to implement parts of step one of this plan. This does not mean we can become complacent. In order for this plan to take place, it is important that Australians continue to practice social distancing and we encourage people to download the COVID Safe app. We expect there to be outbreaks of the virus going forward, but therefore we need to be prepared and take every possible precaution. We always, we always known that our small to medium sized businesses are the backbone of our economy, and certainly in Reid they are, and they create jobs and employ people and, and are often at the heart of our communities. While the financial and so social strain will be felt for some time, I am so proud of the resilience and solidarity I have witnessed in our small business community in Reid. On the other side of the virus, our government will focus on the economic growth. We'll encourage businesses to employ people and enable businesses to invest. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I uh, thank the member for Reid and call the member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, this is an opportunity for me to say thank you to the Jagger Jagger community. This has been a time of anxiety, uncertainty and, for too many, great hardship. Like many of us in this place, during this time I've been reaching out to my community via the phone, via social media and via emails to check in on how they're coping with our vastly different circumstances. And I have been so relieved and heartened by what I've heard and by the approach people are taking. People have been respectful of the public health advice and for the need for restrictions on our movements. They've been looking out for one another and reaching out to more vulnerable community members. People are buying groceries for those who can't go out. They're putting up rainbow signs and teddy bears in the window to try and lift all of our spirits. 
I do particularly want to thank the Austin Hospital and the staff there who have been on the front line. Since day one of this crisis, the Austin have reorganised themselves to be able to run a COVID clinic, a hotline and, of course, to treat COVID patients. And I have heard nothing but praise for all of their efforts. Their biggest fan is 94-year-old Maureen. Maureen was treated at the Austin for, Austin for COVID-19 and she has successfully recovered. Her son contacted me after she was discharged from hospital to make sure I knew just how grateful she was to everyone at the Austin and to us that her appreciation was recorded in the parliament. So Maureen, good on you for what is clearly a strong fighting spirit and constitution and please know that your thanks have been recorded. Of course, it's not just the Austin. Jagger Jagger is home to a strong medical precinct and the work the Austin has done has been supported by our other hospitals, the REPAT, the ONJ Cancer Centre, the Mercy and Warringal Private. Each one of these have done their part to ensure their patients have been well supported and our health system is ready to deal with this crisis and I thank them all. Our community health centres, Banyul Health and HealthAbility, have continued their work providing frontline services to some of the most vulnerable people who have needed them more than ever. Thank you. Banyul Community Support and Information Centre in the Mall in West Heidelberg has been an essential support, and also in the Mall, Himalo have continued their essential work supporting our Somali community. And one of our local footy teams, the Heidelberg North Bulldogs, have been out and about delivering groceries to older people who have been isolated without other support. These are just some of the examples of the way our community has pulled together and shown kindness, compassion and strength in what is an incredibly difficult time. And I'm certainly not the first to observe that this crisis has shown us how the people on our front line have been undervalued by our society. The people working in aged and disability care who've continued their work supporting their clients, often with uncertainty about new procedures and anxiety about their access to PPE. Our supermarket workers, who've dealt with shortages on the shelves, fights over toilet paper, uh, product limits and anxious and unfortunately sometimes rude customers. Our childcare workers, who can't physically distance themselves from our babies and our toddlers, but who have continued to provide love, care and support. I've said in this place before that they deserve a pay rise and I say it again. The teachers in our kindergartens and in our schools. I had the pleasure last week of being able to talk directly with a number of our principals and check in about how their school's been going with remote learning. I was really pleased to hear from all of them that they'd adapted well, that they were doing a mix of online learning and in-person learning, and as well as that, that teachers in the school community were continuing to reach out to parents to check in on how they're going with a totally new situation. Parents, you have done a great job, and your kids probably won't tell you this, but you are heroes. Our community has rallied around local businesses. Our cafes and restaurants have reorganised themselves. And I know for many people that that takeaway coffee, sandwich or curry that they've got in the middle of the day has provided a welcome respite from what has otherwise been a difficult time at home. Of course, we're not done yet. We need to rebuild. We need to keep safe. We need to continue to look out for one another and respect the need for ongoing social distancing. I say to my community that I will be here for you as we continue this work. I know that, that we will get through this time if we continue to pull together. Yeah. And I call the member for Goldstein. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to thank the wonderful people in the Goldstein electorate who have gone and endured, like all other Australians, the difficulties of the COVID-19 pandemic and to particularly acknowledge the resilience of many families and workers who have done the right thing by themselves and their community to keep us safe during a difficult time. And I know a number of other members, including those just expressed their heartfelt thanks and appreciation to the nurses and the doctors in their community. And we have many of those, uh, many based at the Sandringham Hospital in Sandringham, our local community uh, hospital, as well as uh, the local private hospitals, and of course the ones nearby that are doing COVID-19 testing, including Monash and the Alfred Hospital. Each day those people go to work not knowing the circumstances in which they're going to face, and nurses and doctors care and support for those people 
make sure there is proper testing so that we can constrain the outbreak of this virus. They are of course not the only care and health workers who are providing an important service to our community at this time. We have many people in aged care who are doing exactly the same thing for people who are vulnerable and need assistance and support and so we say thanks to them as well. To many of the people who are working in small business, of course to the employers who are supporting workers at this difficult time. We know how difficult it is. Yes, the federal government has provided the JobKeeper program to assist those people and those businesses that need assistance. But let's not kid ourselves and think that it has solved all problems. It hasn't. We have people who face challenges around rents and keeping payrolls going, managing their finances and their debt, particularly when they're restricted from the potential to open. And of course, the workers in the supermarket sector and all of the retail businesses to make sure we have fresh food supply. Because one of the most important things, Deputy Speaker, throughout this crisis is that we remain healthy and happy and maintain our mental health. And maintaining a good diet is an important part of that process. Of course, to the teachers, and as you know, Deputy Speaker, my husband's a teacher, and so he's been Zoom teaching uh, from our kitchen room, uh, kitchen table, uh, as many other teachers have been as well. All the work that you're doing in supporting children's ongoing education so they can go on and not have a disrupted life from this pandemic is critical. And yes, many people have had to learn to do different things, and they've had to learn to be flexible in a circumstance that they weren't necessarily trained to do. And we're greatly appreciative of your efforts in doing the right thing by the next generation so that they can make sure they can continue to go on and prosper and succeed. There are a lot of community-based organisations that have also shown their mettle and how they are an important part of the social fabric of our community. And of course, to the Glen Ira and Bayside Support Services, we say thank you so much for everything that you have done. Of course, there are many days where I walk down the shopping strips of our community and the reality of the COVID-19 pandemic becomes obvious. When I walk down Centre Road in Bentley, Hampton Street in Hampton, Martin Street, Bay Street and Church Street in Brighton, of course the Sandy Village and Beaumaris Concourse amongst many others. And you see how difficult and challenging life can be when people are faced in isolation and difficulty. And many people are also facing the challenge of isolation in their own homes. I know people are getting frustrated. And part of the challenge is finding the balance and making sure we get the measures right. And making sure that you understand the rationale that our states as well as the Commonwealth are taking to make sure we put healthcare needs first. And that is not going to be an easy task now, and it's not going to be able to be, it's not going to be an easy task going forward. But it requires patience and resilience. So if you need support and assistance, don't be afraid to reach out. Make sure you build a sense of social connectedness with others. Use it as an opportunity to exercise, to maintain your physical and mental health. And make sure you show and connect with your loved ones because they're an important part of surviving this pandemic too. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Order, and I thank the member for Goldstone and I call the member for Bruce. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. It's good to be here with you and that champion of free speech over there, the member for Goldstone, because of course the government didn't want this sitting, did they? They cancelled the parliament till August. But even they realised that with school going back and rugby going back, they couldn't get away with not actually having the parliament come back. But these three days have been a sham. This chamber here sat for zero hours yesterday. The government's cut the number of hours for debate, so we're lucky to get two today. If we have a really good day out, we might get three hours to debate things tomorrow. We're in the middle of the biggest crisis for decades, the biggest, fastest economic collapse that this country has ever seen. The National Parliament gathers, but the government won't even allow a debate on the economy. They won't allow a debate in this chamber on the Treasurer's vacuous, content-free, slogan-ridden so-called economic statement yesterday. If you're lucky, you might get 90 seconds. That's what our citizens expect, is that we come here for 90 seconds of fatuous nonsense. 
God forbid, a real debate here. Yeah, I got five minutes. I got five minutes. I got told about this about an hour ago. Democracy is not a ticker box system. That's not something you do and fill out a form and set and forget every three years. It requires real informed debate in communities, in the media, in councils, in states, and also here in the national parliament. It's important, if you believe in democracy, these free speech champions over there in the government, that you actually let alternative debates be aired. Why won't the government refer their own economic statement here so we can talk about it? Have every member of parliament come in and put their words on the record about what they think about the future of the economy and the country, be held to account for their words, and have a chance to raise the issues in our community. Like the queues of people who can't get any food vouchers because the government's emergency relief programs don't work in my community. We should be allowed to come in here and talk about that, every member, not just those lucky enough to land a couple of minutes' slots. The Conservatives claim to be champions of free speech. You've seen them out there railing against communist China, beating their chests. The member for Canning, the zealot in chief of the government, the populist buffoon, the member for Dawson, the member for Manila, they're no better. They shut down and dodge debate. There's no sitting calendar. There's no commitment we're going to be back here any time before August. They cut back the sitting hours and they're too scared to let people debate their own economic statement. Now I thought, actually I was talking to one of my colleagues, manager of opposition business, and I said, are they that scared of what we've got to say? And he said, no, in his wise voice. They're scared of what their own backbenchers will get up and say if they're allowed a free debate, given what you hear is coming out of their party room. The Liberal Party is divided. The Conservative wing doesn't agree with doubling job seeker, do they? They spent the last six and a half years in government making people live in poverty on $40 a day. But even the Liberal Party realised it wasn't going to cut it to let a million middle class Australians turn up to Centrelink, find it had all been outsourced and discover the reality of life on $40 a day. Even they weren't stupid enough to think they'd get away with that. The Conservatives are horrified at JobKeeper. Had the member for McKellar saying it just needs to snap back, we need to get rid of it, shove everyone back on the dole queue, then cut that back in half. They might have called out the rorts in JobKeeper, called out the rorts in the superannuation program, might have discovered that the member for Hughes is now a socialist and thinks JobKeeper should go everywhere. It's unexpected. Worried we might hear the old lines about debt and deficit. Haven't heard them for a while, have we? It was lovely turning up to question time without these idiotic lectures about debt and deficit, given you've had seven years in government and doubled the debt, and now we're on the way to doubling it again. Not going to hear much about that anymore, are we? Might have heard about company tax cuts, the old trickle-down economics. Going to get that one out again. That's really going to get the economy going, send a whole bunch of foreign dividends overseas. We should be allowed to debate your economic statement. Government members should be in here allowed to debate the economic statement. It was utterly content free. Now, it's not often I find myself agreeing with Adam Crichton, member for Goldstein's former housemate, I heard, in The Australian. He said the speech was a political, not an economic document. And then the Commonwealth Bank economist said the standout feature of the Treasurer's economic statement was that it contained no new information. It was all key messages and missed opportunities. Overall, the response, of course, is a huge victory for Labor. We called for the wage subsidy. 160,000 Australians went onto the unemployed queue in the time it took you to put the wage subsidy in place. That's a debate for another day. There's an insane glee over there at the collapse in revenue in the higher education sector and the looming cuts to research. Government members, including you two opposite, who I know believe in this stuff, you should be up here arguing for money to go into research, not silenced, reading out your nonsense dot points. We should be able to have a debate about the economy in reason terms and have every member come in here and state their views. Order. And I call the member for Curtin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. A number of years ago, because one of my sons was studying it at school, I read Tomorrow When the War Began by John Marsden. It's a story which is set in Australia and it's about a teenager, Ellie Linton, and a group of her friends who, after a week spent camping in a place they call hell, um, they come back and they find that their whole town, their whole life has been changed. Australia has been invaded. Their town decimated and the group of teenagers need to find their own way to survive. Um, and spoiler alert here, through their resilience, through their innovation and through their collaboration, they do actually, or well, the majority of them do survive. It's a fantastic novel and series, and there are themes within it which really strike a chord with what we've all been through and continue to go through here in Australia throughout the COVID 
um, pandemic. The teenagers drive each other crazy. I think it's something which probably all of us who've shared houses more so with our loved ones than we have done for a long time can, can resonate with driving each other crazy. But they also realise that being together and working together, despite all of its challenges, is far better than being alone. Like many places in Australia, my hometown, we started this whole pandemic with some toilet paper wars, with hoarding. It then moved on to rice and pasta, no hand sanitizer in the shops, key medications for diseases like asthma and lupus disappearing from the shelves. There was fear, there was anger, there was disbelief. There were concerns passionately held and passionately voiced that were saying we were doing too little, that were then saying we were doing too much. And then there was a subtle change, and it was reflective of us as a nation. We simply got on with it and got on with our lives. The creation of the National Cabinet led the way, in some minds, as to it, in, in the way I look back on it, as a turning point. In my electorate of Curtin, an early meeting between me, three of the state MPs, and eight mayors and CEOs of the local councils had a meeting and we agreed to work together. It operated out of my office and we set up what we called a Curtin Community Care Initiative, giving people the opportunity to volunteer to help others and for those who needed help to reach out to us to find out what sort of help they could get. Our local newspaper, the Subiaco Post, stepped up and helped promote our endeavours. And I particularly thank Brett Christian and David Cohen for jumping on board at the beginning. Over 500 volunteers signed up to volunteer, happily and willingly, to do grocery shopping, to do welfare calls, low-level maintenance and gardening for other people. UWA stepped up to our calls for help to find hand sanitizer, and they made and uh, gave to us vast quantities of hand sanitizer for us to deliver to people in self-isolation and who were vulnerable. I particularly call out Professor O'Donnell, Dean of the Faculty of Science at UWA, and Greg Cousins, technical manager. They were incredible, and, and thank you very much. Our local IGA stepped up, and I must mention Steve from the IGA and Swanboard, who was the first person to get on board with helping people to actually order food online or by telephone so that it could be delivered to them through one of our volunteers. Our local cafes and restaurants immediately innovated. They had to shut down and they were devastated, but they managed to innovate and change their operations so that they could do takeaway meals and that they could deliver coffees. I want to give a particular thank out to, to Glenn at Deli Chichi, who was one of the first operators near my house, who actually went to free home delivery. Also the Cambridge Corner Shop in Wembley. Many of our businesses have been stuck very hard. And there's no doubt that the path is going to be very, very difficult for some time ahead. But to all of them who've been creative and innovative and who are just hanging in there, all I can say is thank you. You are absolutely and incredibly uh, inspirational. It's, it's awesome to see what you're doing. Of course, we, like everybody else, have had many frontline workers in Curtin as well. And to all of them, thank you for everything that you've done quietly, patiently, and just gone about your jobs. There can be no denying that it's tough for everybody, and for some people it's, if it's tougher than others. I particularly feel for all of those who've had to farewell loved ones without a proper funeral, and for those people in aged care who haven't been able to hug their grandchildren. I just want to finish with a quote from Ella, Ellie from the book. We've all had to rewrite the scripts of our lives over the last few weeks. We've learnt a lot and we've had to figure out what's important, what matters, what really matters. It's been quite a time. Order. Um, the adjournment debate was due to conclude at five o'clock, but unless there's any objection, I propose to allow the final two speakers to conclude and give their remarks. Uh, if there's no objection, I call the member for Blacksland. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, we're all stuck in them. Most of us can't wait to get out of them and we need a hell of a lot more of them. I'm, I'm talking about housing. I think uh, one of the many things we've learnt over the last few weeks is the importance of housing, safe and affordable housing. Uh, we often think about our homes as our castle. In the last few months, they've been our fortress. They've helped to keep us safe and protected so many of us. That's why a couple of weeks ago, I, I called on the National Cabinet to establish uh, 
an eviction moratorium, a freeze on evictions, to make sure that people weren't thrown out on the street in the middle of a pandemic. It's the sort of thing that was done in the UK, it was done in New Zealand. I'm glad to say the Prime Minister and the Premiers agreed to do that, and states have now legislated or are in the process of legislating to put that into place. And I sincerely believe it's going to help to save lives. It's going to help keep a lot of people safe. And just as housing has been important in the middle of this pandemic and keeping us safe, I think that it can play a very big and important role in helping us in the economic recovery that we now embark upon. Uh, housing was a big part of recovery after World War II, Curtin and Chifley building more homes. Uh, it was a big part of getting us out of the teeth of the global financial crisis, building more homes, keeping tradies working, um, getting the, the, the economy back on its feet. And it's something we need to think about again here too. Um, the housing industry has been warning us for weeks that work is fast running out and new orders have fallen off a cliff. They're not my words, they're the words of the Master Builders Association. They're saying that work is fast running out and new orders have fallen off a cliff. And it makes sense if you think about it because the pandemic hits, you've lost your job or you've lost hours or you see all those terrible pictures on the television. The last thing you think about is making a massive investment, the biggest investment in your life, to purchase a new home. And so people have stopped making those investments and three, four or five months' time after when they would have made those investments, concrete isn't being poured in those places around the country where new houses should be being built. What the Master Builders Association are saying is that instead of 160,000 homes being built this year, it now could be as low as 100,000. Instead of 160,000, 100,000. Now, if that happens, that means a lot of tradies and a lot of small businesses in the housing game are out of work or out of business. And this is not a small industry. Almost a million people work in building homes for other Aussies, from carpenters to electricians to plumbers to all of the businesses that produce the products, the bricks, the tiles, the plasterboard, the timber. And if the industry collapses, if the industry is not building as many homes, then you've got a lot of people out of work in the months ahead. That's why today in question time I asked the Minister for Housing if the government is developing a plan to make sure this doesn't happen, to make sure these people don't end up on the dole queue. And all we got was crickets. I got very little evidence that the government is developing a plan to stop this. The Minister read out a list of the things the government's done, things that we support, like establishing NIFIC and the First Home Owners Deposit Scheme. He talked about JobKeeper. But remember, JobKeeper ends around September. These tradies are running out of work over the next few months. They're going to be out of work around the same time that JobKeeper ends. And nothing that he listed there is going to turn around that drop-in houses built from 160,000 to 100,000. The government needs to get its head out of the sand here. If no action's taken, then we're going to have tradies lose their jobs in all of our electorates all around the country. That's why this week the opposition said, well, here's two ideas, here's two of the things that we could do. We can invest in building more social housing, repairing existing social housing, bring forward some of the things that are already in state budgets. State governments are already doing some of this, but we can do more. We've done it before, it works, it keeps tradies working, and it repairs the sort of housing that needs repairing. Here's another idea. We could build more affordable rental accommodation for frontline workers. If we've learnt one thing out of this crisis, it's just how important nurses and cleaners and bus drivers and supermarket workers are. They don't get paid a lot, don't get to work from home, often travel long distances to get to work. There are some projects around the country where they are building homes for these sorts of heroes, affordable accommodation closer to work. State governments are doing it, super funds are doing it. We could do a lot more of it. We've got to do something here or we're going to have a lot of tradies on the dole queue in a couple of months' time and a lot of small mum and dad businesses out of work. I urge the government to think again and take action to keep these tradies working. And I call the member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to speak on an issue that my constituent in Higgins, I've heard from many constituents, my electorate of Higgins, I've heard from many constituents concern about a very important problem, and that is the early years. Um, and I rise because I have many mothers in my electorate, as I'm sure all the members in this parliament do have. And it's a group of people that sometimes can get lost in the melee that is our healthcare system um, and in the response to our crisis um, that is the COVID pandemic. 
So we know that Australians are incredibly resourceful. We know that we are an incredibly resilient country, and I'm actually very proud of what the federal government has done with response to the health crisis that is the COVID crisis. And one of the most important things that we've done is to roll out telehealth. And this has been incredibly important because it has allowed medical practitioners and allied health practitioners to provide services which have not been face to face. And this has been good because in Australia it's an innovation that we've been able to use right across Australia for rural and remote healthcare provision. But now with the COVID pandemic, uh, the Minister for Health, Greg Hunt, has rolled this out for all healthcare interactions. And this is something I think as Australians we should feel very proud of. And it is something that I believe that we can lead internationally with. And in fact, we could in theory become the healthcare providers um, from a knowledge point of view for the Asia Pacific area. But what I wanted to address was an issue which is clearly a deficit when we look at the provision of services for child maternal health. Um, the child maternal health services in the state of Victoria are provided by the state government um, and by the local government. And what I'm hearing from my local constituents is the fact that these services are not being provided in the short term. Now, I do understand the concerns that local services have around providing face-to-face -face services, but it is very important that new mothers are given the opportunity to have the support um, of peer-to-peer -peer networks. And in the state of Victoria, child maternal health services routinely provide uh, peer-to-peer -peer new mother groups, which are incredibly important in those very important first weeks of life. And I'm very um, pleased to tell you that there is this uh, new and innovative company called uh, Mama You've Got This. And, and this uh, group of two uh, young mothers who live locally, in fact, they live in the seat of McNamara, but they have approached me, and they're doing this fantastic job of setting up Zoom meetings for young mothers. And they're delighted that they have 450 mothers participating across the whole of Australia. It's an innovative solution to a problem that has occurred very quickly. Um, and they have had mums right across Australia that have been in this virtual mothers group. Um, the mothers have been able to share stories to share the ups and downs of being a new mother, of working out some of the solutions that they have found uh, together, because there's nothing like um, more than one mind um, making a problem a lighter load, but also coming up with great solutions. Uh, and more recently, the Mama uh, You've Got This started to offer free live expert question and answer sessions through Instagram Live. And you'll be interested to know that one of the paediatricians that they've got on as their live experts is none other than Dr Lexi Frydenberg, who is also um, a local um, constituent, um, but more importantly is the sister of the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg. Um, and uh, Lexi has been a wonderful um, expert that has helped these mothers with expert advice using Zoom. And that is a great and creative way to make sure that these mums are getting what they need. But what I am concerned about is that it seems that, um, and we're now seeing, hearing this through this group, that the two-week uh, uh, baby check is not happening across Australia, and it's something I'm cons very concerned about as, as both being a paediatrician by training but being a mother of four. The two-week baby check has to be face-to-face -face because as a very important component. Child maternal health nurses in Victoria go to um, the parents themselves um, and they weigh the babies. And at two weeks, sometimes babies may have more than 10% body, uh, body, body weight loss in the first two weeks of life. And that happens, it can be a red flag that the child has some underlying problem or that they need to seek um, support and advice. So we know during the COVID crisis in the last two months, there has been up to 50,000 births across Australia. And this two-week check um, is clearly not being delivered uh, in a uniform and standard way. And I'm cons very concerned about this uh, for young mums, particularly for first-time mothers. And I call on state governments to review these processes because as a federal member, I'm hearing this from my constituents and these other groups uh, that I've just talked about are also hearing it from the people who are participating in their Zoom meetings. So I call on the state governments across Australia to make sure they think about this carefully vulnerable group of people, young mums who are very prone to postnatal depression. They're dealing with the struggles of a COVID pandemic, the fears of going to seeing health services. We need to reach out and wrap them in the services as a support. So thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order, I thank the member for Higgins. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those opinions say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Ration Chamber stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow in accordance with the resolution passed by the House on the 12th of May.